1 John chapter 4, beginning in the 7th verse. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. It's okay. You can come in. He won't bite. He's just a small baby. A little shot? That's okay. I am too. Do your friends love in such a rush? <clears throat> to go tell the world. I think that's how they put it. And what a thing to tell. Did you know an angel was in you too? And he said that my boy would be great, the son of God. He said that he would be the king of angels, the king of all. Do you think that they'll understand? Do you think that they'll come to worship him? Will they accept him? Just look around us. It's not exactly palaces to do. Noisy animals. Hey, out of all things for a bed. And that stench for everything that he is.
gift of love. Today we take a look at the Christmas story from the perspective of Mary, uh, at least the second most important person in the Christmas story. In a couple weeks we talk about Joseph. Joseph wasn't all that necessary to the story, uh, and we'll get to that. Uh, but as you mothers know, Mary was pretty important. Without Mary, there's no Jesus. Isn't that interesting? That's the way God chose uh, to bring his son into the world was through uh, an earthly mother. But we also discover in this video, uh, in, this, in, in the person of Mary, what God is like. That he just chooses to use simple fallen human beings to carry out his tasks. To carry out his greatest mission ever, and he chooses people to do it. And we get to see today in the story of Mary what that's all about. Mary, of course, was humbled by this experience to be used by God in the most extraordinary way. Our first uh, point in your outline says this, that she was humbled and that she was overwhelmed by all the things taking place in her life. We read in uh, Luke chapter 1, it says, The bird's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. What an overwhelming experience for Mary to be not only to, to see an angel, if you read through the Bible, at least in the New Testament, every time somebody encounters an angel, one of the first things the angel says is, fear not. Apparently, it's a frightening experience to encounter an angel. Something holier than us. Something wholly dedicated to the service of God. And Mary is encountered and encounters this angel, and the angel's word for her the word for the day is you are highly favored by God. What an incredible greeting. What an incredible blessing. And she's overwhelmed not only by that, but also by all the other things taking place. Here's part of the, the reading that wasn't in there. It says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, of course, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. He says it a second time. You have found favor with God. He says, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. How can this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the most high will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Incredible. This is overwhelming news for Mary. Right? The history tells us she was probably somewhere between the ages of 14 and 16 when all this took place, which wasn't terribly uncommon at that time uh, for women to marry at a very early age, but she was not yet married, and all of these things were new to her in her life. Never mind the visit of the angel. Just saying that she was that age, she's getting married, she finds out she's going to have a child soon. These are all overwhelming pressures. Add to it the pressure to parent the Son of God himself. I don't think the fact that he was going to be the perfect child alleviated any of those fears. Instead, it seemed to, to mount them. She was overwhelmed by the tasks that were ahead overwhelmed by the news of what God had called her to do and the struggles that would no doubt ensue because this was no normal child. She was overwhelmed by that. Maybe you found yourself in old times of your life where you've been overwhelmed. Perhaps it was surrounding the birth of one of your own children. Not sure what to anticipate. It seems like more than we can bear. But for Mary, that news begins with encouraging words that she is highly favored by God, that he has taken a personal interest in her, that he is aware of the things that are taking place in her life, and that he is pleased with what she has been doing. 
then, as we see in this uh, dramatic depiction in our film, is that Mary is there with her child and she is overwhelmed again. This time, maybe not so much overwhelmed with responsibility, but overwhelmed by her own personal capacity to do something. She discovers a new depth of love. Luke chapter 2 says this in a simple phrase about her old woman capacity. It says, Mary treasured up all these things, and she pondered them in her heart. I don't know about you, but I remember when we were expecting Gavin, uh, our firstborn, and people were telling me at church and other places that I wouldn't be able to believe how much joy, how much love I would have for him. And I was already very excited that we were having a child. And yet still, even that excitement was completely overshadowed when he was actually born. And I got to greet him for the first time. Maybe some of you have had that experience. It's incredible. You, you think of yourself, okay, I, I love people. You know, you love your parents, love your friends, you love others. And then you have a child and you learn a whole new appreciation, a whole new level for what love can be. And then I remember when we were expecting... Declan, I actually had some fear that maybe I had all my love had gone to the first one and there wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't be as exciting to have another. And I was completely overwhelmed again. I remember I had, unfortunately for her, she had to have a C-section and I had promised to stay by her and that she could be the first to hold little Declan when he arrived. The problem was, the second I heard him cry, I popped up and ran over to see what was happening, and I got to hold him first. <laughs> Made a new promise for tomorrow, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> so let's you know next week if I was able to keep that promise or not. But Mary was overwhelmed to discover that joy, to discover a new kind of love that she had. John one of the closest friends that Jesus had on life here on earth in his later book, it's so confusing, I apologize. It's not the John that comes at the beginning of the New Testament. It's the John that's at the end by the book of Revelation. Uh, it's actually a letter that he wrote. It's called First John. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another. He says, For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Recognize that love is a gift that comes from God himself. For us to truly love other people, we need to be loved first. Our children learn how to love from us. Our world experiences a lot of brokenness in this place. You know, our journey to, to try to have a uh, Callum, who's the forthcoming, we also were a, a part for a long time of, of trying to, to foster uh, and to adopt and to be a part of that. And we, we met a lot of, and encountered a lot of families who had not learned what it meant to love. They did not know how to love their children. If they hadn't experienced that from someone else. You know, it may seem to us that love is such a natural thing, but it comes from some place. It comes from outside of ourselves. That oddly enough, we are not a bottomless source of love, but that God is. God reveals himself to us numerous times in the scriptures. There are numerous verses that say God is love. That is at the very heart of it. That is what God is. And we learn love from him. And Mary was blessed that as she had that overwhelming joy of having a child, that child wasn't just any child. It was actually the universal source of love. It was God himself put in that pathetic little manger for her to care for as he humbled himself to be born in such a way to come and to show us what love really was. That love wasn't just emotion, that love, as we're going to discover, would also become action. Love would become care for others. Not because they deserved it, but because the one who loved cared for them. You know, so often in our world, love gets attached to what we deserve. Maybe we love our spouse. Because of the things that, uh, about them, maybe the things that they can do for us. Maybe we love our children uh, because of the things that they can do. And our love starts to falter when that attraction, when the whatever cause, whatever source of lovableness of them seems to diminish a little bit. And God shows us a completely different way 
He teaches us a greater love as he sends his son into the world to be cared for by a young girl, essentially, in ancient Israel. He reminds us that he judges the world in a completely different way. And he shows us this in the most incredible depiction. Our next slide says this, that there is an earthly indifference to the birth of Jesus. You know, now we celebrate Christmas with lights and, and all kinds of things, but the first Christmas wasn't celebrated that way. The first Christmas, essentially, nobody cared that Jesus was born. The world was indifferent to the fact that he was being born. And in a strange juxtaposition, heaven was overjoyed. Incredible. Luke chapter 2, as go on, says this. That an angel uh, appeared to shepherds, and one of them showed up in our video. The angel said again, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. He says that will cause great joy for all the people. But notice at the time, very few people were excited about Jesus. He says, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. Right? This is heaven's sign of something incredible happening. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The video of Mary says she felt obligated to bring a blanket. Moms are always prepared, right? Mary set the precedent for that. Moms had to be ready for things. She was bringing a blanket. Good thing that she did, because there probably weren't a lot of cozy blankets in the barn where Jesus was born. But what an incredible sign that these shepherds, and by the way, shepherds, we'll talk more about them uh, next week, but shepherds were pretty much the bottom of the barrel of society at the time. They were not uh, considered important people whatsoever. They were kind of the, the throwaway people of society, and yet God went to them, and they heard the news first. He says, you're going to go, and you're going to see something that's really probably not all that exciting. Right? The least glamorous thing we see at Christmas time is a baby laying in straw. There's lots of more glamorous things at Christmas that our world has concocted. Maybe again, they're trying to overlook the baby Jesus. But notice where God's priorities lie. He's not excited about all the great things that the world is excited about. He is excited because his son is coming into the world to rescue and to redeem everything else. To redeem us from our distractions. To forgive us for our valuing all of the wrong things. To forgive us for loving in an often very shallow, shallow way. To deepen our understanding of what he is like. He comes and he loves us. He shows us the things that really matter, even to this day. So much the world knows about Jesus, and yet how much of our world is trying to push Jesus as far as possible out of Christmas. And I'm, I'm not one that cares whether you say Merry Christmas or, or Happy Holidays. But many people would rather not hear about Jesus in this season. I had lots of uh, Frozen. There's a new uh, short film out about the holidays, about finding different traditions than the one that define the season. Jesus, to find other things to be excited about. For some reason, we seem to want to push Jesus aside. We want to push the news that was the greatest news on earth aside. And it's nothing new. Because nobody was excited that first Christmas about Jesus being born in a manger, except for some lowly shepherds, and of course, all the company of heaven itself. Depending on the translation, it seems to suggest that not just did God send down like one quarter of the angels to celebrate the birth of his son, but it seems like he gave them all the day off to go down and to celebrate that this was the greatest thing that had ever happened in the history of the world up until that point, that God had come to live amongst his people, to show them, to show Mary what love was all about. And just as Mary was overwhelmed by her new capacity to love, Mary also discovered that she would be overwhelmed by how much love this son of hers had for her. Point number four says this, that we are overwhelmed by his love. God indeed teaches us what love is all about. First John chapter four says this, it says this is how God showed his love among us. And notice that love is an activity. It's not just an emotion. 
He says he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And then it defines for us. Maybe he shows me the teenagers one of the definition of love. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Incredible. On the cross, we get to see just how much Jesus loved not only his own mother as she was there at the foot of the cross, but also how much he loved every single one of us. How much he loved every person who has ever lived. Incredible that on the cross, Jesus loves us. He forgives us. He shows us what love is. Love is sacrifice for those that we care about. Love isn't harming others. Love is being willing, perhaps to be harmed for the sake of others. To show them how incredibly valuable they are. Nothing could diminish the incredible words spoken to Mary by that angel who came to her and said, you are highly favored by God. Incredible. But you know what? The rest of us also get lifted up at Christmas because Jesus came for you too. And on the cross, he says of you that you are so highly favored that your life is more important to him than his own. That your life is more important to God than his own son. He is willing to sacrifice him for you. To show you that, yes, in that pathetic manger, yes, on that hobbled together cross, God was demonstrating his incredible love, not just to the whole world, but also to you. That you matter enough to him to trade everything for you. How incredible. And I hope that you remember that this Christmas season. That Mary is not the only one who got to hear the words that you are highly favored, but that you also are highly favored by him. Mary literally carried the love of God for nine months, and probably many months after that, as she carried him around. But we also get to be blessed to be carriers of God's love. As we go on to our, our final point here, that we are carriers of his love. John, uh, 1 John chapter uh, 4 says this, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. He says, no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, he says, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Again, he repeats those words, we love because he has first loved us. That's one of the great joys of this season is to be reminded of how much God loves you. That he came into the world for you. But we also get to be reminded that we are not the determination of his love. That in fact is plenty of love for us to spread to others. Just as I discovered when I had a second child. That yes, I can love two just as much as I can love one. And my love actually grew. It didn't get divided into two different places. It actually multiplied over again. And we have that same joy as we share his love with other people. That his love just continues to grow. That his love encompasses not just us, but everybody around us. That's the joy we have to share at Christmas. That's the smile that will be on our face today. As people want to know what they can do in order to have their gifts wrapped. And say, no, just like the gift of Jesus was free for us, this gift is free for you. Because we're just trying in our own simple way to pass along the love that we have received from Jesus. Right, that's why our church is making a sacrifice to be a part of the movie night on Friday night so we can show a little bit of that love. That's why some of you are going to give up the warmth of an indoor Sunday evening and go outside into the cold, even though we have our little hot chocolate hand warmers, and try to share that joy with our neighbors. Not just to gather here and sing to each other about Jesus, but to go out to our neighbors and sing to them about the joy that there is because God has come to his people. He humbled himself to be born from a young woman, to live a life as a human being and ultimately to give his life for us and for everyone else. Indeed, we get to be carriers of that love. If you feel this season like you're low on that love, you've also come to the right place because our Lord desires to refill that love for us. On the very night 
Before he gave his life for us, before he gave that incredible love to his disciples, he gave them this special meal and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This is remembrance of me. In the same way also, once they had eaten, he took the cup. When he gave given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. His feast is ready. You may come to his feast.